Get Puck. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Get Puck podcast. Vito, Dave, and Matt here with you. Dave, the only one, oddly enough, with a last name on our display here. But hey, I guess he carries the the big weight. You know, he gets the full picture. Anyways. Uh, gentlemen, today's a big day. Today's a good day. Today, officially, for the Montreal Canadiens and their fans, hockey is back. Preseason, thank the good Lord, is done. Uh, theoretically, well, more than theoretically, yesterday was the actual first day of the NHL. There was a couple of games on the docket, but as we are a Montreal Canadiens podcast, our season starts tonight. Um, some interesting things, however. One of them uh, at the forefront that I'm, I kind of want to talk the most about Um the the whole idea that they're going to go into the season now carrying three goalies. Mm. So these three goalies sitting here, obviously that is not an ideal situation for anybody. I don't think any of the guys like it, considering they're going to have to share the, the ice uh, considerably. Um, and if they don't, then what are you doing with, with one of your goalies basically not playing at all and only kind of just getting reps in, in practice? So something's going to have to give there. I guess I kind of want to know, gents, what you feel about Primo. And are you of the mindset, like so many others out there that are suggesting, if he goes on waivers, it's a guarantee he's getting claimed. It's it's You had to keep him because a team called and was asking about him. And if he goes on waivers, that's it. We're grabbing him. I mean, you have guys like Martin Jones, for example, from Toronto, who has a super digestible contract, played in the NHL, and he went through. No one put claims there. Now, I'm not saying it's the direct comparison, but, I mean, are we that scared? And what would you do, given um, if you had the reins with this situation, how would you handle it? Debbie Day, start with you. Yeah, so, I mean, I think it was a smart move in the sense that they would probably they probably would have lost them, right? I think that they probably would have, uh, as I, I said last podcast, uh, I think that Tampa probably would have made a claim on him or, or anybody else. And, obviously, there was a team that inquired, so someone was interested in uh, – Kane Primo. I think um, they're kind of just maybe hoping that teams figure it out with their goaltending situation and then they can sneak them back <laughs> into to, to Laval at one point. But, um, I mean, obviously it's not ideal. You don't carry three goaltenders. There, there was rumors that the Leafs were going to carry Martin Jones for that exact reason. They ended up leaving him go. I think Martin Jones is a little bit different in the sense that Martin Jones is not going to be the future anywhere, right? Whereas some teams may be able to look at Kane Primo and say, hey, maybe we develop this guy into something special so I think it is a little bit different um it's a tricky situation and it's a situation that kind of sucks for the Canadians because like obviously you don't want to lose Kane Primo for free but is he really the answer here do you want to see it's just a very bizarre set of circumstances and now they're stuck kind of handcuffed with three goaltenders none of them are really bonafide number ones at least not well, yet so yeah. it's it's what it's gonna be interesting to see like are they really gonna split between the three is it just gonna be a monty and allen type of thing and primo just you know hey he's a body here and he practices and that's it. <laughs> go 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 knock the pucks off the bench when the game starts primo thanks yeah yeah it, it, it makes no sense to me either i don't know uh, unless there's a move in in the wings you know unless you know maybe maybe jake allen got the start is getting the start tonight because hughes says hey Let's showcase Jake Allen a little bit, and we can we can see what we've done. Don't, don't, don't steal my second Dave. question, Dave. Don't okay. steal my second question. Sorry. Don't get people excited, Dave. Don't get people excited. It's just uh, the situation makes no sense. No, it doesn't. You don't I, make I sense just, of it for us. I just don't see them wanting to risk losing him for free, right? So to Dave's point, yeah, he's not going to be the goaltender of the future. I don't think so anyway. But doesn't mean he can't be a good NHL backup down the road. He's still young. He's 24 years old. He hasn't hit the prime of a goaltender's career just, just yet. Uh, the thing is with Martin Jones, he's completely in the back nine of his career. So he's really was picked up and signed as a depth option for what they think is going to be their year once again. Um, and, and as for Primo, if there's a team that's already interested, that's pretty telling right then and there that they're going to at least make a claim for him if, if it got to that team. We don't know who the team is, but the speculation is there. Kent Hughes did say that there was somebody, a team that was interested. So you know that he was going to get claimed. So why why lose him for free when you've already developed him to whatever capacity, but you've developed him for the last uh, six years, let's say. But, so. but doesn't that make you handcuffed now? So because he gets one phone call, Kent Hughes, and a, from a team saying, hey, we're interested about Caden Primo, and he goes, okay, forget it. We're keeping him up. So So that's it? One call, and now you can never send him down out of fear that that one team is going to scoop him up. 
I'd say maybe it's a bit of, of gamesmanship. Maybe, you know, you keep them up oh, and no, say, hey, I, yeah. that team that called, hey, you're not going to get them for free on the waivers. Up your offer maybe a little bit or or take a longer look at Jake Something. Allen, please, it, because it, we're not going to give you Caden Primo for free. I, I don't, I don't okay. know. What it makes me do. wonder, right, because there's a bit of a need in Columbus for a goaltender, especially a backup one because they have injuries. The only got is Lickens. And now, you know, there's people linking Boquist to Montreal. and Maybe there's something that can be worked out there. No hey, sources, just happens. speculation, connecting dots. But – you know, it's need for need there in a sense. It's it's solving a problem for a problem, and uh, and the only thing that that concerns me a little bit is that if either Allen or Monty go down and you've moved Primo, who comes in? You're gonna call up Dobesh. I mean, that's a problem problem for future candidates. That's a that's the best way to say it. Like who's you can't even begin to think about that right now to be like, oh, if we moved one of those guys and one of our one of our primary or backup get hurt, what do we do? I just at this given point, I think to segue into the second part of my question here with the whole Jake Allen starting tonight, which I think took most people by a little bit of surprise, given that he did not have a very good camp whatsoever. Yeah, Monty, Monty. Either yeah, for yeah, that yeah. matter. A lot of people even suggested that you should almost consider starting Primo. But back to what Dave was saying, could this be a potential showcase? Not, oh my God, showcase, but you have your your Jake Allen. He's, he's, he's I'm for sure, a backup on, on um, maybe not the majority of teams out there, but a significant portion of teams out there could use a Jake Allen as a backup without question and, and get an improvement on whoever they currently have. And so if you think about it from that perspective, if you put Jake Allen out there tonight, somehow he does very well. And then you play him again because he played so well. Like perhaps maybe they give Monty the Saturday or whatever, but like Jake Allen plays the majority of the first couple of games of the season and he somehow stands on his head. And 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 now you have this nice little trade piece where you're like, well, we're prepared to do Monty Primo here. We know it's kind of sort of a lost season again, and we're still rebuilding, and that's okay. But now you have this this trade piece, this goaltender that's out there. Maybe that's what this is, because otherwise I'm a little baffled by it. I can't really understand why you put Allen out there to start the season. What team, though, needs to see Jake Allen play three games in order to make a decision? You know see that I mean? he's healthy. See, it, that's see, the how, only thing. see how that's he the only thing. after last year. I don't know. It's, that's the only thing, is to see if he's healthy. And the only other the only other thing I would think of is it would have to be a team that's contending or needs that kind of depth to say that they're going to make a long run or they think that they're one of those contending teams that go and take a gamble on Jake Allen. It won't be one of the bottom teams or oh, one of sure. the teams that are, you know, it has to be somebody that's contending. So you automatically people are going to link and say, okay, um, Tampa Bay is a team that could use a goaltender like him until Vasilevsky comes back. And even when Vasilevsky comes back, Allen's a better option than Johansson. But it's a, he's got a pretty high cap, and not every team, yeah. especially the contending ones, can fit Jake mm-hmm. Allen. So, but if it's uh, not if it's not for that, then I mean, then tell me. Let's put that aside and pretend like it's not a showcase. What is the other reason behind it? Is it simply a matter of they put names in a hat and they pulled Allen? Well, well, Marty is, is he said, at the first? He he's the top of the chart. He's ahead of Montebo. I think Marty St. Louis said it. He said, I think that Jake Allen gives us the best chance to win on Wednesday. Look, I mean, I think Monty didn't have a particularly good camp. Jake Allen didn't blow anyone away either, but maybe Marty St. Louis saw some things in him that said, look, he, he deserved it. He worked extra hard. He he, he deserves the, the day one start. Uh, and, and it's as simple as that. Sometimes we kind of try to look at conspiracy. You know, we, we, we're kind of like, what, what's the meaning behind this? What's the hidden meaning? And sometimes it just isn't. And from experience, sometimes it's just you have two goaltenders, you're going to pick one. And no matter well, what, it could be the veteran thing. I well, guess it could, also it, it could be, be the veteran thing. It could be the yeah. fact that while Allen didn't have a great camp, Monty did let in two goals that should have never gone in on any NHL caliber goalie. And really? maybe goals. Uh, I, I, they were so bad. The first one, you're like, okay, fine, shake off the rust off season it's you know it's during preseason you want to shake that stuff off but the second one okay no you're just not focused uh, i'll put i'll play allen at that point I, I don't know if he lost his his i don't even know if he had the job to lose because of two bad goals i just think ultimately if caden primo wasn't an option if you were never going to start the season with primo and i think even though primo had a you can make the argument a better camp than both of the other guys he wasn't going to be an option to start 
So now you got Allen and you got Monty, and they both didn't play great. Um, you give the nod to the more seasoned veteran to start the season, and, and and that's just the end of it. I think probably that's the real reason. Although it's always nice to sit back in the back of your head and say, as a double bonus, if Allen does play very well and can string together some really good performances, a team like Tampa, which makes a lot of sense, could look to get him as the guy that they can go and share one two with until uh, until Vasilevsky's back. It's uh, that's that's a the only uh, the only team that I think. Thing. Could... The only team that I, that I could think of can, that can fit Allen's contract without having to do any cap gymnastics and trading players is Buffalo. But does Buffalo feel like they're the team now that's going to be able to take the next step in their in their season? Well, he doesn't really make them take the next step. I don't yeah. think. Well, I just I think you got a lot. You get you get Devin Levy to have a veteran guy to help him out a bit, which um, they don't have right now. Yeah, they don't. They they got. Three young goalies. Yeah, so so maybe, but then again, like, what are they doing? Like, is 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 that something they they feel like they absolutely need? Like, I don't know. It's and 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 they're not doing it because Buffalo called. I'm sure not. Listen, at the end of the day, it was a little puzzling. But the more we talk about it, the more I simply think that this is a matter of nobody's the clear number one here. You're I'll not going to put the kid ahead of Monty or Allen. And if you got Monty and Allen, you put them both up there and you both look at each other and say, listen, even if I consider you both equal at this point, I'm going to give the nod to the guy who's going into a 16th season. Start. That's probably what we're looking at here. So that makes it a little bit less fun, a little bit less spicy, I guess. But but I think ultimately that's – that's we solved a little bit of the riddle of the Allen start tonight. But would you say that this that is I have lot, for you, the last – would you sorry before you jump to the next question? Would you say that this is the last issue Montreal has to completely finalize their roster? The and last? you say, okay, this, this no, 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 with this current roster because you know we had too many defensemen, too many forwards. Now we have too many goalies. Are They've you addressed... saying that if they solve the goalie situation, the team is ready to roll? Is that what you're asking? No, me? no, 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 no. I said for this season because at the start of the season we kept saying, hey. Montreal's got too many forwards. Something's got to change. Something's got to happen. They have too many defensemen. Something's got to happen. Something's got to move. They've kind of addressed some of those things, you know, putting Army on waivers, which, yay. Um, and, you know, the yeah. defense, there's still quite a few defend, defensemen, but they've kind of figured out who's going to stay with them. Okay. By putting, I, get, I get your question now. I get now, your question now. Now we've got three goalies there. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 you can't carry three goalies all season. So eventually something's going to give there. Someone's going down on waivers or a trade out of nowhere is going to happen and then then you have an actual roster. But but realistically looking at the team like that is that is the no, bottom no, 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 of the no, no. totem pole of things that are that are important for the team to address right now. Well, you know I mean? they like, definitely oh, need to figure out their goal time situation. Now, I'm not seeing what Allen Montable, they got to yeah. get a bonafide number one at some point. But you guys have heard what I thought about the goaltending depth across the NHL in general. It's not very good these days. Um, so that that would should be an important, important need to address going forward, in my opinion. If, if you want my opinion about the goalies, if you want my take about it, I think there's going to be a lot of stop gaps until one of the guys they drafted ascends and takes the spot. I don't think they're going to trade for a goalie to become the number one in this market. I don't see it happening. I can't. I can't see it happening. Interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where. Maybe, maybe you go get somebody to help one of the young guys after Allen moves on or whatever. But a, I don't see them finding a trade partner to bring in a number one goalie here. It's a long stopgap though, because I mean, like these guys yep. are years off. So, like, if that's yep. the way they're going, fine. I get it. And you kind of maybe hope and pray that maybe Caden Primo becomes that guy. We saw that good run in Laval play for the in the playoffs, but I. Not sold, not sold on that. I mean, I I think that if they could find a goaltender somewhere, they would. But you're right; it's going to be way easier said than done. Oh, just I, I I don't disagree with that take either. I just think they don't find one. I don't think yeah, they I, find a willing partner to dance with, and I don't think they're at the point with the rebuild where they're prepared to give up a lot to get one of these guys in here. So you hope that that Primo is the guy with maybe Monty. That would be a good tandem for the next maybe two years. And then you hope one of these other kids is starts to show some brilliance and you get like a Devin Levy from Buffalo or or Wolf over in uh in um Calgary. Calgary, thank you. Um, who was sent down incidentally? Um but, uh, but Darren yeah. Dreger just just wrote out or wrote out a 
about half an hour ago. I have no doubt in my mind if they put Caden Primo on waivers, he's not clearing. So there yeah, you go. Yeah, but but it that doesn't change the problem they have. No, it doesn't. And you have to find you have to find somebody else. Then then if you're so sure that Primo's going to be claimed on waivers, then you have to play him. And then you got to think which of the other two. Well, I guess should, should okay, something I think with. That, okay, Monty is probably the goalie that they can easily move to tomorrow just because of his cap and you know he has some NHL experience. So I guess my question to you, both of you, is I don't like how it. much better how much <laughs> better or worse is Primo to Monty? I I I don't I don't like this question. <clears throat> I don't like this okay. question. Listen, right. does it is Got the it. is the <laughs> difference between the two of them dramatic? I don't think so. Would I put Monty in a game over Primo today? Not using recency as a bias, yeah, I put Monty in over Primo today. But can Prim can Primo still get to a higher ceiling? I mean, the bigger hockey minds of the world keep telling me, yeah, he had a really like Dave said, he had a really good playoff last year in Laval. These are promising things. But normally speaking, if I take, you know, and he was very young still, but whatever, the, any time of type of actual NHL game time that he's gotten has not looked great. Now, the team in front of him has not been great, too. I know there's a lot of that, but, you know, you got to try to win, ultimately. What do you do? So you don't want to lose him. He's he's your guy. You think you might have him there for the future. So then, so then yeah, you, you roll the dice and you trade Monty. And you keep you keep Primo and Allen if that's really where the the team is looking, because obviously they want to keep them. If they if they didn't care, they would have put them on waivers. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the right move is to trade Allen. I think you have to move on from him. But I mean, it's, his contract's gonna be tough to move for a guy like him. And it's just, you know, I, I'd be okay with a Bonte Primo and see what they got. You know, sink or float, just toss him in and see what what, what you got with them. Um, you know, wins don't matter right now, you know, at, at this stage. So I'd be okay with it. But moving Allen, again, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. I'm not 100% sure the door has been – I think they've been trying probably to move Allen, and, and I don't think people are knocking down the door to get him. No, I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be an easy trade. I think you have to find the perfect situation. You have to find a team that is competing, that lost their goalie, um, and wants to have a, a, a legitimate, decent backup goaltender, or or a really good guy who's in there as as a as a uh, a stopgap until your main guy comes back. I mean, I keep coming back to Tampa as like like what a perfect situation if they can make this work. It's just the it's just the price tag attached to him is is really going to hinder that. But I want to move past the goalies right now because there's another little riddle, if you will, that I, I like to take you guys take on. Josh Anderson finds himself on the top line. A lot of people not happy with this. A lot of people banging their heads against the wall saying that this has been tried and tried and tried and it has not worked. Why are they doing it again? And so part of my question is, do you think that there is an actual cause, like a reason that 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 the team looked and said, hey, Allen, or, or Allen again, see, I'm stuck with the goalies, that Anderson did something in camp or showed something that, that merited that spot? Or could it be that he's there as a del facto because they really, really like Slavkovsky, Doc, and Newhook, and realistically, you're not dropping Anderson to the third or fourth line, so he's there by default. Is that more plausible, or did he earn that spot? I think it's mainly because you have Dvorak who's out, who would have played 3C, and a lot of people had slotted uh, Monaghan as uh, Suzuki and Caulfield's right wing. So because of the injury, kind of shifted things down. I also think it's because they want Kirby Doc to be a center and not play right wing either. So when you look at it that way, Slavkovsky's maybe not ready to be uh, on the top line just yet, and Andy can fit that role, whether they have the chemistry or not, but he can definitely create space for Caulfield and Suzuki. And at the same time, Josh Anderson during the preseason was a beast. He played well. He drove the net. He did a lot of the good things that you want to see Josh Anderson do. And uh, is this going to be his real year where he produces the way that we expected him at the age of 29? Who knows? But one thing's for sure, right now, today, Josh Anderson is the best fit for that first line role on the right wing because 
if it's what I'm thinking that they want the Doc in the middle, then they're, they're playing him in the middle. And if it's because the, the Vorax out who can't fit the 3C, the only plausible person who can slot as the 3C right now is Sean Monaghan. And that's why I really think that Andy's there. But if Slavkovsky, I think it's his spot eventually, just maybe not right now. Yeah, 100% is because Kirby Doc is the They want Kirby Doc at center. Uh, and there's just nobody there. Slavkovsky, you know... He's not a he's not a top top line guy right now. You can't kind of force him into that role. I was all for it, to, you know, to start off the experiment last year, but you can't have him there. It's not sustainable to have him there all year. It's not it's not where he's best fit. And so there's just Anderson, and you're not going to put Gallagher. There. Like there's nobody else that could play that role right now. So, so, so it, it wasn't earned. It's it's just but it was, it's, a it's a bit of both. No, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. If Anderson had a terrible oh. camp, maybe he doesn't get that right. Maybe he doesn't like. But he had a good camp. He's you know. He, He's very good against the Leafs, you know, coincidence or not. But, yeah, uh, you know, okay. but I mean, what I mean is, is you know, he did earn it. So I, I, I'm not 100% sure it's, it was a lock for Anderson, but I think it just made sense in, 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 under the circumstances. But they could have put Newhook there. And he could have played the second line with Doc and Slav. So there is something to be said that that second line, they right. really like that But together. I think that... I think they want. It's also they want to balance the size thing. When you look at Caulfield and, and Suzuki, and if you put a new hook there, it's a lot of skill, but there's nobody really creating space on the ice or being an, an intimidating presence of sorts. It's just a smaller I, I, lineup. I don't disagree, but he again, right? And I happen to like Josh Anderson quite a bit, but because you guys are taking such a strong stance on one direction, I want to go devil's advocate the other side. He's been there before. He yeah. was supposed to do what you're suggesting he's do he's going to do now, and he didn't. He did not make the space. It did not look like chemistry well, was okay. there. Okay, I'm going to – hold he on a second. so much slower I, than I, them. They're not the same into these lines, right? It's not as if you submit your lines and this is – I'm not saying it. cement, but they're doing this yeah. on purpose. They're yeah, icing this lineup on purpose. For sure. Josh Anderson was also, at the time when he was put on that line, uh, and it didn't work, he was also learning how to be under Martin St. Louis' coaching style. And he was figuring out how to, uh, all of that stuff at the same time, and it, j it didn't work. So now he's gotten a bit used to You saw at the end of last season, Josh Anderson's game was starting to pick up. He was starting to get used to the, uh, call it the, the concepts that, uh, that Martin St. Louis kept speaking of and not many people understood. Um, but <laughs> <What>? <laughs> well, everybody kept calling it the concepts. And like, what are those concepts? They kept questioning it. But anyways, with that being said, now it seems like he's, he's kind of getting used to the uh, – Martin St. Louis coaching style, getting understanding it a little better. And you saw at the end of last season, Josh Anderson was actually starting to pick up. He was having some good games. Then preseason comes along and it's, you know, the power forward we were looking for. And some people might criticize me on that, especially the true Josh Anderson haters. Uh, but I think yeah. right now it's it's a there's a there are many reasons to give it another go. And especially if it means that you keep Kirby Doc in the middle. Where you were, you initially traded for Kirby Doc to be your two C. Th that's the best way to do it. Is plug Josh Anderson there if it really means that you can have Kirby Doc as your center and just play center and he doesn't move. Then that's the that's the right call. Okay, so so it's a little bit of like, well, where else are you going to put him? It's also a little bit so far this season, preseason, anyways. He's looked very good. Uh, give it another whirl and see. They really like that second line, so so that, that's going to stay as is. And where else are you putting him? He, he's not playing fourth line, and your third line, which also is that third line we had talked about a little while ago. What I predicted. Come on, give that, it. Go yeah, on. yeah, yeah. So I, we got to come up with a name for that one. Um, but collectively, they might have more more man games. Fastest, fastest line in the NHL. They, I think they might have more man games missed than the entire second line has actually collectively played games in the NHL, if I think about it. 100%. It'd be close. It'd be close. I wanna pump, I'm going to do the math on that one another time, but it's pretty wild stuff. So ultimately, um, another thing that happened on the lineup that that obviously got a lot of attention because most people were were kind of, I guess, surprised that, that Hughes and Gorton would actually do it we talked about this before, but Armia went on waivers, cleared waivers, reported to Laval. Um, really good, really, really good that they were able to pull that uh, pull that trigger and do it. He did not earn a spot in the top twelve, and and obviously, um, as as consequence, found themselves on waivers. Are you guys shocked by that? 
did that really blow your minds or you're like, ah, oh, well, I'm kind of surprised, but yeah, I, I expected it. Well, it was the right move to, to make. Um, For sure. A little bit like, oh, okay, good. They actually did it. You know, they actually had the, the you know, the wherewithal to, to, to pull the trigger and do it. So, but was I shocked? No, because, you know, it's a business, right? And, and you got to do what's right for the team. You got to do what's right for the organization. And I think you all know me as we're in this course here. And I think that the right move was to put them down. A little bit surprised that they actually did it because, you know, we've seen in the past that they've been reluctant to do things like that. But uh, happy it's done. And now you can move on from the uh, UL Armia era. Mm. Agreed. Only surprised that they actually pulled the trigger on it, but it was something that I was calling for. I wanted it to happen because he hasn't earned his spot. And I, this is a clear cut message from the administration saying that just because you have a high, uh, an expensive contract and you're a proven NHL, it doesn't necessarily mean you, your spot is guaranteed on the roster. So they're sending that message. It's a fantastic culture to adopt on the, on the team. You have to earn everything earn your way, earn your keep on the roster. So when they did that, and it was it was nothing but an applause coming from me. It's a great thing. They they made space for the younger kids that are the players that actually deserve it. Um, could, some people could argue, hey, uh, why does Tanner Pearson get a shot? It's because Tanner Pearson has been hurt and hasn't been ass for the last two years. Armia has, been, has not been good. He shows up one out of every 10, 15 games. So why would you deserve a spot? The best part, the, the best Armia we saw was during the, the cup run. And he has, he's been a shell of that since and always getting hurt. So yeah, go in the I mean, I mean, find just, your just game. Small, small little point there about Armia is, is granted, this might not be 100% the reason, but supposedly he, his, he getting COVID twice and, and subsequently dealing with long COVID apparently that he has, has he's never been the same since. Well, since, it's since possible. Yeah. It's possible. And if that's the case, I'm I'm sorry for that. And I really hope he gets Yeah, better. no, 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 for sure. I'm, but, but like, I just don't want to rip his, his, his etiquette. Is all From a hockey player perspective, it wasn't working. It's still not working. He's getting paid quite a lot of money for the type of game that he's bringing and the inconsistencies that he's bringing. Go in Laval. Nobody claimed you. Find your game there. Be a veteran for the kids that are there. And if you find yourself and find your game and you could come back after dominating the AHL again, then come back. But bring your value up. Make make not only the Montreal Canadiens see what your value is and what you can bring, all the other teams in the NHL have to see what you can bring. But right now, Yolonen was playing better than you. Oh, Raphael harvey Kennard, we have to make the space for you. And, and so on. Pizzetta, they didn't want to wave him again. They just like what he brings for the depth player that he is. So I get it. Armia was $3.4 million on the fourth line and wasn't even capable to play a decent role on the fourth line, not to mention his injuries. So good job, fantastic job by the, the Hughes-Gordon administration on finally making that move. And that is the first expensive proven NHL player that they made that kind of decision and that they waived. Well, I think we're all in agreement, and I think most people are in agreement that this is long overdue. And uh, while maybe a little bit surprising, again, because it's, the, like you mentioned just, just now, it's the first time they've done it to a NHLer with an NHLer contract, you got you to gotta earn it every night. Even though you got the money, even though you got the contract, you have to be bringing something that is uh, seen as a positive to the team. Um, and unfortunately for him, that hasn't been the case for a while. Um, uh, last thing I wanted to, to ask you guys and this was a question that um, that somebody had asked me, saying, "How do you how do you stay engaged, knowing that the team is likely going to lose, you know, three out of four games for the entire season? Um, and and how do you go watching game after game after game, um, rooting for a team and that team constantly losing? And so it got me thinking. Uh, my first answer back was, "Well, the storylines." And then they're like, "Oh, okay, like what?" And so, saving my storylines. <laughs> For, for after you guys answer, um, what are some of the storylines that, that Habs fans could sort of follow along in your opinion that would make the season a little bit more tolerable if they end up doing what most people and most analysts and most hockey mind people out there are suggesting uh, is going to happen with this team, which is they're in a super hard division. They're going to finish bottom five. It's going to be a lot of losses. What is it that people can hold on to that can have them tune in to game after game um, to, to root for something, to cheer for something, to not be hyper discouraged. And, and while you're always at the back of your head, yes, top five pick, yes, lottery pick, woo, it's still rough, man. You get to midseason and you've lost a ton of games. It's hard. 
it's mm-hmm. hard to keep grabbing onto that. So what do you got for the fans out there, guys, as storylines? Well, the storylines are easy. I mean, first off, there, there's a little bit of hope that they might be a little bit better than, they, than than last year, you know, that they could go on a run. Look, again, they're a team that are, are going to be um, – they're not going to be prepared for much. You know, they're going to be, no one's going to, you know, value them highly. I think that they could sneak wins here or there and they could, they can have some fun doing it. Now the real storylines, obviously can Suzuki progress to be a game, a point of game player. Can he really take over that number one role and really grow into it as everyone expects him to, or will he again, you know, kind of not struggle. He didn't struggle by any means, but you know, he, he, he didn't develop. He, he needs to take the next step. In my plateau. eyes, you hope that be, he doesn't plateau. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cole Caulfield is he going to hit an, uh, a reasonable amount of go- of goal number? I think that's very important. I think that's fun. It's something that you can look forward to every day. It's almost like a home run chase with Barry Bonds. Is he going to score tonight? Is he going to score tonight? Mm-hmm. Is he going to score tonight? Is he going to add to that number? Uh, I think that's uh, everything. And then it's the more you know, not, I don't want to say boring stuff, but like will Slavkovsky develop? Will Kirby Doc fit, fill into that second? Uh, center role. How's the new hook project going to work? Will Tanner Pearson be able to bounce back? Will Sean Monahan get traded for a first round pick at the trade deadline? Uh, how's the defense? Uh, which defensive prospect? Rapid fires. Look at this. <laughs> which, Take defensive, notes, fans. <laughs> which defensive prospect is going to grow into what we expect of them to be? Those are kind of the underlying storylines. But I think if you're a casual fan or if you're a fan that really just wants the big stories, I think Suzuki, Caulfield, and that's about it. All right. You know, what are you looking for in storylines that uh, people can grab onto? Uh, for me, who will they subtract from the, the roster? Who will they add to the roster throughout the season? Um, what moves will they make? Well, you know, some are suggesting that Doc, Doc has the talent to be, to actually be a number one center. He's got the, the ceiling to be one. Will he overtake Suzuki? That's something I'm going to look. We'll see if he has his breakout year this year because he's a breakout candidate for Montreal, at least. Um, I, I mean, Dave already mentioned Suzuki and Caulfield. Those are those are the obvious ones. One that a lot of people are have mentioned recently is Caden Gooley, really the number one. We put so much focus on Lane Hudson, Ryan Barker, and all those guys, but Caden Gooley, barring like any injuries and minus the injury he had last season, last season, he was showing that he could be a top pairing defenseman. And uh, maybe we were looking at it all wrong and saying, hey, down the road we're going to see Lane Hudson and Ryan Barker together. Maybe it's actually. Reinbacher and Gooley, or whatever the case may be. Maybe Gooley is the guy. Um, what's going to happen with the goaltending situation, which we've spoken about at nauseum already. Um, th- those are some of the storylines. Will Montreal move up in the standings? See, I- I'm, not, I'm not saying that they're going to be a bottom three team. If everybody's healthy, I do believe that Montreal is not contending for a playoff spot, but we might see them in that 7, 8, 9, 10 slot. Uh, which some people would say that's a huge mistake, but that's, for me, yeah, that, for me, yeah. I look, I look at it as they have a lot of young pieces already. It's not They're crazy, still- man. It's, it's it's not. It's not crazy. We've seen worse teams do better. Like all you need to do is get, come together as a team at the right moment, and 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 you'll see. Like teams won't be prepared for the Canadians. I'm guaranteeing you it. And that's in in a throwback seat. They're going to look at the Canadians. Ah, oh, it's a letdown game. There, there's a potential there all year. For them to surprise teams, it, it, it wouldn't be like a crazy, crazy thing for them to be like, "Oh, can they make a playoff push?" Like, I don't think they're a playoff team. Don't get me oh, wrong. What day is it? What day is it? <laughs> October eleventh. Dave says, "Could they be a playoff team?" It's not crazy. It's not awesome. crazy. Uh, you know what? One of the storylines recently that came up was uh, Marty St. Louis was interviewed and uh, he was asked about the power play. And what happened with the power play last year? And his response was, we didn't focus on the power play because we were focusing on bettering our game five on five. So that's something to look for. Are they going to actually focus on the power play now and stop doing that drop pass to get everybody in? And you know, That's, that's a very, play. very depressing comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. When I, when I hear that, that, it makes me want to cry. It, it is. So is the power play going to get better or is it going to stay the same? Because one thing that we can all agree on, it's been abysmal for oh, years. It's far too long. Far too long. In fact, that's okay. that's one of my three things that I'm looking for. I'll be monitoring the power play and the PK because they're both so bad. So I want to see if there's improvements there. Um, you know, besides the Su- Suzuki chase for point of game potential and and Caulfield going for forty or fifty or whatever, which is always going to be fun to watch. I want. I'm really going to be focusing on Slavkovsky this season. Yeah, really want to see where he's going to get to. Uh, new hook. What do you have in this kid? So far, I've, I've really liked it, and I. 
really like that line. I really, really like that line. I hope they gel. I hope they have a lot of chemistry because I find it super, super uh, entertaining to see those three kids out there. Um, One we but, haven't spoken but, about is, is Matheson. Will Matheson continue where he left off? Yeah, that's another good one to kind of, I mean, it's less sexy going back to Dave's point. Like it's a little bit more of a boring thing, but, but you know, yes. Can what about Harvey Pinard? What about Harvey be... Pinard? Well, well, See, will Harvey Pinard yeah. still run an adrenaline and have the kind of season and the kind of start uh, to his NHL career like he did last year? But or I feel are we bad for Harvey RHB. Pinard that's, like, that's a fringe guy. Well, and, and I feel bad because he's not going to get the opportunity like he had last year. He was shining because look where he was playing. Now look well, where he's playing. Well, you don't know that. We can hope that they don't get injured like they did last year, but injuries well, do for happen. Sure, for sure. But I mean, just storyline wise, I mean, RHP on a line with Evans and Yolone, and will he will he get the same ice time and the same opportunities as when he was up there playing with Caulfield and Suzuki? I think not. Mm -hmm. What so, about Jack Guy? Will Jack Guy take a leap, not only in terms of being the guy who can be the sheriff on the ice, but he's got a wicked shot. They're using him on the power play now. Can he be serviceable? in other aspects of the game rather well, than just being talk, a guy who's stable defensively and could, you know, uh, hurt a couple people and rip a, rip a wrist or when need to, can he be a bit more for sure of a Swiss army I mean, knife type of defenseman? If, if you want to talk about the defenseman though, I think the more interesting storyline on defense is Norlander, who's going to be in the opening roster tonight to see what that's going to be. Can he continue his really uh, strong play? I think Norlander was sent down, Matt. He was sent down. He was oh, sent was down. he sent down? Yeah, he was sent down. Because I saw Barron was scratched tonight, so, yeah, so I thought be, that meant it was a paper it, it, transaction. It's going to be Har Harrison, uh, Jack Jack Harris. Harris. Okay, well, and Kovacevic. Forgive me for that one, because I hope to see him back up. Because that's uh, a little I more interesting. I think it's one of those story. scenarios. I do think it's one of those scenarios that they probably sent them down and told them, "Listen, you did great. Whatever. We're just, you know, we're going to try to make space for you. Uh, you know, you're the first call yeah. up. Whatever the case may be, just go dominate in the in Laval and play your game, and we'll call you up when when the time is right." But but the carousel that exists on defense with the young kids is something to watch just to see which one is really going to grab it and cement themselves in that position. So that's another one that's exciting. You have it there, uh, everyone who's who's stuck around to the end. You got a lot of different things from um, from the three of us about uh, potential storylines that you can grab onto that you can uh, be paying attention to throughout the course of the season. If if the team ends up doing like as expected, finishing very low and, and accumulating many, many, many losses. The other hope, of course, is that the games are close. Let the losses pile up, but let them be close. Let them be 5-4. Let them be 4-3. You know, big scoring kind of games are fun to watch. Nobody likes losing. I know a lot of people sitting back, a lot of guys in the media out there are like, they need to lose again. They need to be lottery team, bottom well, three. Okay. Let me jump in on that. It's just hard. I, I want predictions from both of you. Where By the end of the season, make your prediction now. On, on the opening night, what will the Montreal Canadiens, where will the Montreal Canadiens finish in the standings? I want one spot. Are we doing like a, like a hot takes? Or do you want like our honest opinion? Like a... I'm going go, to go honest opinion. I'm going to go honest opinion. I think they're going to finish seventh to last. So Seventh the that? last yeah, so 25, 20, 25? 25. I think they'll be 20, 25th. Dave? Okay. Oh, man. Um, I think they're going to surprise, man. I think they're going to do a lot better than that, what people expected. Um, Ooh, fringe team. Okay. Here it comes. <laughs> Give me that final wild card spot. Why not? Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun on the Get Puck podcast. And uh, give me that 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 final playoff spot. They are not a playoff team. Okay, I don't want you guys anybody to to get me wrong. Or but if they could stay healthy while other teams don't, if they could steal some games where other teams you know don't, give me that last wild card spot. That's gonna that lock me in there, and that's what uh, that's where I see them. Okay, so yeah, you're but, saying last wild card, Matthew said seventh to last, which is basically twenty fifth. And then that leaves me. They're not going to be dead last, barring some catastrophe. So I'm going to go with they get another fifth overall pick. Which mm -hmm. means, uh, what is that, 20, 27? They're gonna finish right, around, right around where I picked. Okay, very, mm -hmm. very good. Very uh, Oh, we see what oh. you did there. We see what you did there. I did the prices right, just a dollar. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
It would be 25th, uh, 28th, sorry. If you want the 5th overall, 28th. Yeah, 28th. Yeah. Okay, right. There you so go. there you go. They'd be 20. That's what I'm saying. They're going to get another 5th overall pick. I hope that for everybody else, they're just, you know, people will have fun and understand that this is still a rebuild year. I still think Montreal is going to be in a rebuild for an, at least another two seasons. They're going to finish off those, uh, get you know, 2025 uh, draft picks, which so many people, I don't know if you guys saw that comment before we uh, end this episode where Kent Hughes is stating that he's got a lot of assets and things can happen in the 2025 year and including, you know, people are already speculating offer sheets of some kind because Michelle's got literally everything they need to do in, to submit an offer sheet and still have the same number of picks for those rounds. Well, not the number of picks, but the same picks for those rounds. First, second, third, and fourth. Man, I'm not thinking about 2025. The fuck didn't even drop for this season. Listen, I am everyone... always thinking... Thank you for uh, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for listening. Obviously, a couple of things we love to know from your end. Uh, what are the storylines you're looking to uh, keep track of throughout the course of the season? And to Vito's question, where do you see the team winding up? Let's hear your predictions. Throw them down in the comment section so that they're black on white on paper. Can't go back, and um, we'll uh, we'll 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 be around all season long. Obviously, this is the first episode of the of the start of the season. Um, we're super excited about it. So pay attention to the social medias, of course, the the X, the Twitters, the whatever. What is this? Yeah, what, 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 what is this, Dave? Last, Last wild, wild card. card. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's it. Right. I want it right. in a frame behind you under that TV, <laughs> Dave. And I don't want it to move. I don't want you to pull a fast one on us with a different paper. Anyways, thanks so much, everybody. Like, subscribe if you haven't already. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. And for Dave and Vito, I'm Matt. And this was Get Pucked.